We are going to do lines composed a few miles above Tintern Abbey by William Wordsworth. So if you will find that, please, in your portfolios. This starts on page 44. You have the poem. It's a long one. And then the questions are on page 47. So we'll try to do this in a little bit of an orderly fashion, kind of reading through it once and then looking at the questions to guide our analysis of the poem. If you guys get cold and need to move over here, or if you get hot and need to move over here, it's fine. Um, and I'm sure there will be some um, travelers walking through here. They'll forgive us, but it's the best spot I think we can find. Um, so just looking at the title of the poem, where do you think Wordsworth wrote this poem? A few miles above Yes. So we don't know exactly where, but look at those mountains back there. He could have been anywhere along there looking down at this same site. And he found it inspiring and wrote this poem. And it is just absolutely inspiring. It's just so regal and beautiful. And I completely agree with Matt that as nature begins to overtake it, there's just something magical about it. It's the mixture of the man-made and the God-made kind of corresponding with each other. I'm going to read this one to you. So if you will just follow along with me on page 44. Five years have passed, five summers, with their length of five long winters. And again I hear these waters rolling from their mountain springs with a soft inland murmur. Once again do I behold these steep and lofty cliffs that on a wild secluded scene impress thoughts of a more deep seclusion and connect the landscape with the quiet of the sky. The day has come when I again repose here under this dark sycamore and view these plots of cottage ground, these orchard tufts, which at this season with their unripe fruits are clad in one green hue and lose themselves mid groves and copses. Once again, I see these hedgerows, hardly hedgerows, little lines of sportive wood run wild, these pastoral farms green to the very door and wreaths of smoke sent up in silence from among the trees. With some uncertain notice, as might seem a vagrant dwellers in the homeless woods or of some hermit's cave where by his fire the hermit sits alone. These beauteous forms through a long absence have not been to me as is the landscape to a blind man's eye, but oft in lonely rooms and mid the din of towns and cities, I have owed to them in hours of weariness, sensations sweet, felt in the blood and felt along the heart and passing even into my purer mind with tranquil restoration, feelings too of unremembered pleasure, such perhaps as have no slight or trivial influence on that best portion of a good man's life, his little, nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and of love. Nor less I trust to them I may have owed another gift of aspect more sublime, that blessed mood in which the burden of this mystery, in which the heavy and the weary weight of all this unintelligible world is lightened, that serene and blessed mood in which the affections gently lead us on until the breath of this corporeal frame and even the motion of our human blood almost suspended, we are laid asleep in body and become a living soul, while with an eye made quiet by the power of harmony and the deep power of joy, we see into the very life of things. If this be but a vain belief, yet oh, how often darkness and amid the many shapes of joyless daylight, when the fretful stir, unprofitable, and the fever of the world have hung upon the beatings of my heart, how often, spirit, have I turned to thee, O sylvan why, thou wanderer through the woods, how often has my spirit turned to thee. And now, with gleams of half-extinguished thought, with many recognitions dim and faint, and somewhat of a sad perplexity, the picture of the mind revives again. While here I stand, not only with the sense of present pleasure, but with pleasing thoughts that in this moment, there is life and food for future years. And so I dare to hope, though change no doubt, from what I was when first I came among these hills, 
when like a row I bounded o'er the mountains, by the sides of the deep rivers, and the lonely streams wherever nature led, more like a man flying from something that he dreads than one who sought the thing he loved. For nature then, the coarser pleasure of my boyish days and their glad animal movements all gone by, to me was all in all. I cannot paint what then I was. The sounding cataract haunted me like a passion. The tall rock, the mountain, and the deep and gloomy wood. Their colors and their forms were then to me an appetite, a feeling and a love that had no need of a remoter charm by thought supplied, nor any interest unborrowed from the eye. That time is past, and all its aching joys are now no more, and all its dizzy raptures. Not for this faint eye, nor mourn, nor murmur, other gifts have followed. For such loss, I would believe, abundant recompense. For I have learned to look on nature, not as in the hour of thoughtless youth, but hearing sometimes the still, sad music of humanity nor harsh nor grating, though of ample power to chasten and subdue. And I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns and the round ocean and the living air and the blue sky and in the mind of man, a motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things, all objects of all thought, and rolls through all things. Therefore am I still a lover of the meadows and the woods and the mountains and of all that we behold from this green earth and all the mighty world of eye and ear, both what they half create and what perceive, well pleased to recognize in nature and the language of the sense, the anchor of my purest thoughts, the nurse, the guide, the guardian of my heart, and soul of all my moral being. Nor perchance, if I were not thus taught, should I the more suffer my genial spirits to decay, for thou art with me here upon the banks of this fair river, thou, my dearest friend, my dear, dear friend. And in thy voice I catch the, the language of my former heart, and read my former pleasures in the shooting lights of thy wild eyes. Oh, yet a little while my, may I behold in thee what I was once, my dear, dear sister. And this prayer I make, knowing that nature never did betray the heart that loved her. Tis her privilege through all the years of this our life to lead from joy to joy. For she can so inform the mind that is within us, so impress with quietness and beauty, and so feed with lofty thoughts that neither evil tongues, rash judgments, nor the sneers of selfish men, nor greetings where no kindness is, nor all the dreary intercourse of daily life shall e'er prevail against us or disturb our cheerful faith that all which we behold is full of blessings. Therefore, let the moon shine on thee in thy solitary walk and let the misty mountain winds be free to blow against thee. And in after years, when these wild ecstasies shall be matured into sober pleasure, when thy mind shall be a mansion for all lovely forms, thy memory be as a dwelling place for all sweet sounds and harmonies. Oh, then, if solitude or fear or pain or grief should be thy portion, with what healing thoughts of tender joy wilt thou remember me and these my exhortations? Nor perchance, if I should be where I can no more hear thy voice, nor catch from thy wild eyes these gleams of past existence, wilt thou then forget that on the banks of this delightful stream we stood together, and that I, so long a worshiper of nature, hither came unwearied in that service, rather say with warmer love, oh, with far deeper zeal of holier love, nor wilt thou then forget that after many wanderings, many years of absence, these steep woods and lofty cliffs and this green pastoral landscape were to me more dear, both for themselves and for thy sake. Okay, we're gonna dig into some important parts of this, but what is your initial response to it? What is maybe one thing that you heard or picked up on or felt as you heard that? No wrong answers, just a response to the first ever reading. Very lofty, very like, it makes you feel 
present in this big place? Lofty, you mean like intellectual, yeah, sophisticated, yeah. or something else? It's powerful. Great. It's powerful. Yeah. yeah, the imagery lets you be there. What else? What was there? Yeah, how so? An invitation. Okay, let's dig in a little bit. Question one, according to the repetition evident in the first few lines, how long has it been since Wordsworth has, Wordsworth has visited the river Y? Five years. Five years. That's the easy one, we'll start there. Which means he had been here before and then comes back again and something about it feels like home. Okay, you see that in me this entire trip. Everywhere I go, I'm like, this is my happy place. I love this place. I'm connected to this place. Because that is for me a return. And for me, it's been four years. So this kind of resonates with me, the idea of coming back after a comparable period of time. All right, we are gonna work through some poetry terminology today as well. So I'm looking for four examples of alliteration in the first stanza. So that's the first sort of 21, 22 lines. But first you'll have to remind me what is alliteration? Yes, so blue baby bottle would be alliteration. It's that first initial consonant sound repeated over and over, and it has to be in close enough proximity that you hear it, because this poem was meant sort of to be read aloud, otherwise there's not a lot of point to alliteration. It's the sound of it. So let's look for some examples. Secluded scene. You could even pull in steep from the line before and seclusion from the line after and sky from the line after. Because when you're reading it all together, your ear keeps tuning into that S sound. Okay, someone else. Hedgerows, hardly hedgerows. That H sound is a great example. Someone else? Woods run wild. Woods run wild. And it's interesting, the R even sort of carries that W sound through it. And let's pull in that next line too with the reeds. Wood run wild, reeds of smoke. I'd like to hear that someone else can do alliteration besides those two. This requires no inference because you are looking for a letter that is duplicated closely together that has the same sound. So you wouldn't use a C if it was like ceiling and car because that doesn't sound the same. But other than that, it works. Little lines. Guess what? I know you can do this. I just have to check that others can too. But yes, of course, little lines works. Somebody else. There's more than four. There's a lot. What can you find around line 20? So you're going to lose all of your photography and gift shop time if you don't participate, because I'm not going anywhere until we're done. Shut up in silence is great. What's the repetition of, of consonant sound in lines 19, 20, 21, 22, right around there?
Maybe you need to hear it. Vagrant dwellers in the houseless woods or of some hermit's cave where by his fire the hermit sits alone. What letter do you hear over and over? H. The H sound. Yeah. Houseless, hermit, his, hermit. I often with alliteration just circle the first letter and just keep doing that anywhere they're close together. But there's a time. So what is the effect of the alliteration? I gave, I gave away that it sounds, it's for the sound quality, but what does that sound do? Does it make you focus on those words? It can draw emphasis to those words. What else can it do? Yeah, it gives it a flow. And by that, we're really talking about unity. And it almost duplicates what you would see in a painting with these long brush strokes. He's painting a picture for us through imagery and sound. And that's why you're picking up on the tone of this sort of grand um, regal or um, what word did you use? Lofty. Lofty tone, yeah. Okay, number three. Let's see if you can recall. This is a challenging one. I'm looking for the name of a rhyming technique. It's not alliteration. That's one rhyming, rhyming technique. Quiet of the sky. Hue and lose. Hermit sits. What do those groupings have in common? Vowel sounds are the same. Do you hear it? Quiet and sky. Hue and lose. Hermit sits. Now who can name that technique when you have the repetition of vowel sounds in close proximity? Starts with an A. That is called assonance, A-S-S-O-N-A-N-C-E. Okay, number four, it's not two specific examples that I'm looking for. I want to know what examples stand out to you related to imagery. And when I talk about imagery, I'm talking about language that allows you to experience it through sight or sound or touch or something. So what comes to life for you in stanza one? Yes. The sound quality of the soft inland murmur, it backs up to sort of line two, three, four, Again, I hear these waters rolling from their mountain springs with a soft inland murmur. You're meant to hear it, that little ripple. What else can you see here? Um, these pastoral farms are it's like a green to the very door. Those are like Bible. You remember the word pastoral from just the other day? I taught it to you. What does it mean? Um, the of like fields, or should be a yes. Church. Any anything related to meadows, sheep, pastures, shepherds, any sort of rural existence would be pastoral. So pastoral farms, you have to picture the countryside little tiny farms placed in all what does it mean green to the very door what is there an absence of human life or human what did you say <laughs> there's there's no buildings i'll hold off on the human because there's one um and there's no concrete pavement sidewalks <laughs> like it is just the farm like it just was dropped in the center of the green. But keep going with that image. Wreaths of smoke sent up in silence from among the trees. What would a wreath of smoke look like? Can you see it? Wreaths, circles of smoke coming from where? 
the chimneys in the farmhouse. Isn't it a beautiful scene? Who is there? The hermit, just someone reclusive, the farmer sitting there alone. Anytime you hear a word alone like that, it's meant to establish tone. So there is an element of solitude in this that contributes to the peace of the surroundings. And number five, it asks you to refer to a poem that we studied stateside earlier this year. In the first 10 lines of the second stanza, you can mark them off if you want to, to see where we're talking about. How is the effect of those 10 lines similar to the effect the daffodils had on the speaker in I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud? Now, if you need to look back at the famous daffodil poem, it is the bottom poem on page 41, but hopefully you remember what did the daffodils create for the speaker? I'll read you a few lines to, to jog your memory. For oft when on my couch I lie, in vacant or in pensive mood, they, the daffodils, flash upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude, and then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. Anybody remember? And not so. kind of where he went, where he went to write and like think about new ideas, maybe. Yeah, that's definitely a component of it. It becomes his happy place because now, whether his mind is filled with thoughts or completely quiet and silent, suddenly the memory of the daffodils, he's not still present, that happened a, a while ago. But the memory of the daffodils flashes on his eye and it fills him with bliss and happiness. Okay, that's the revisiting of the daffodil poem. Now let's go to the first 10 lines of the second stanza. These beauteous forms through a long absence have not been to me as is a landscape to a blind man's eye, but oft in lonely rooms and mid the din of town and cities, I have owed to them in hours of weariness, sensation sweet felt in the blood and felt along the heart and passing even into my purer mind with tranquil restoration. Feelings too of unremembered pleasure and it goes on. But how do you see that similarity happening? They're both like this happy place kind of work too, like he's relaxing and at peace about it. Yeah. I may have shared this with you and I did with a few people in Canterbury Cathedral the other day, but I once had to have armpit surgery and apparently they cannot numb an armpit there are too many, there are just too many feelers there. They can't numb it. So I was in a lot of pain in the emergency room going into shock. My mom was with me and she said, Greta Zeppo, go to your happy place right now. And so I went to Canterbury Cathedral. <laughs> I'm like, okay, Canterbury Cathedral, boys choir singing, filling up the Gothic arches, la 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 la. And my blood pressure just began to drop and I just, I was okay, and then the surgeon said, okay, you're all done. I mean, that is the magic of psychology. You can mentally take yourself somewhere else. So that has been the effect of this visit to this landscape all surrounding this area, that for him, it centers him in moments of stress or whatever, whether he is lonely, whether he is in the middle of towns, which he did not like. He did not like the Industrial Revolution, smokestacks and child labor and all the things. He hated it. So he says, in those moments, I can take myself to these places and I feel sweet sensations, tranquility, a purer mind. Have you experienced anything on this trip that you think could possibly be a happy place for you later? Just the memory of it could bring you happiness. Why are you not all shaking your head yet? <laughs> of course you have. I think you have. If you haven't, it is to come because we're going further north into the countryside along the coast. Hopefully everybody finds a connection point. 
To that point, I'll just remind you that the very last assignment you will ever do for me is a reflection on this trip as a whole, and you're attempting to identify three sort of life-changing or shifting perspective moments, crux moments, and you'll have to show something about those, whether they're pictures or sound bites or videos or journal entries or whatever. So just keep that in your mind when you know you're having a moment or there's a chance a moment will mean something to you later on. Just think about what artifacts you have to take you back into that moment. Okay, let's look at number six. I'm looking for two literary techniques. In the line, I turned to thee, O Sylvan, why thou wanderer through the woods? You learned Sylvan before, what is that? The forest. Forested. Forested. And then what is the why Matt has told you? A river, yeah. So I turned to thee, O forested river, thou wanderer through the woods. What literary techniques do you see? Personification. Personification, to call the river a wanderer. That's great. What else? Who is the speaker talking to? Jillian pointed it out for us the other day. Apostrophe. apostrophe, well done. Talking to the river is apostrophe. What about a sound technique? Oh, where? Where is it? Let's look at why wanderer woods alliteration. Very good. All right. I want to come back to number seven. We're going to just skip that for a second and go down to number eight. This is a huge chunk of the poem, so it's hard to point you exactly to the perfect lines, but I want to go to line, we'll start around line 68. When he says, and so I dare to hope, though changed no doubt from what I was when first I came among these hills. How long has it been again? Years. What has happened in that amount of time? Jesus. Who was he then? A boy. What is he now? Okay. I want to look in the lines to come and see if you can find words or phrases that identify what he was like in nature as a boy. There's not only one right answer, there's a lot. Words and phrases that describe how he was then, his former self, his boyhood self. What was he like in nature? Sorry, say it again. Okay, she's looking at the acts of kindness and of, and of love. Um, Let's dig in a little bit more, though. An appetite for what? Okay. There's a hunger. Appetite is hunger. There's a hunger for it, for sure. Any guess what a row is? When like a roe, I bounded o'er the mountains by the sides of the deep rivers and the lonely streams, wherever nature led. A deer? It's yes. a deer. Yeah. Bounding, like, can't you just picture a boy in nature just running crazy? Like, I have two boys, and when I would take them outside or to a park, I'm yelling, less risk, less risk, because they want to climb every tree. The size of trees my boys have climbed 
dear Lord, <laughs> you know, jumping off things, jumping in the rivers. I mean, they're just, it's very natural for boys specifically, but I think any youth to have that response to nature. But look how it continues. More like a man flying from something that he dreads than one who sought the thing he loved. Chew on that for a second. What's that picture he's painting here? More like a man flying from something that he dreads than one who sought the thing he loved. So I look at this as somebody going back to his carefree days and wishing he could go back there. And as you grow and you refine, you become more reserved, more cautious. Um, you hold back a little bit more. And I look at him going back to that time through pleasure. Yes, there is an appreciation for who he was. I, I don't know based on what is to come that he wants to go back to that point. Because in his more sublime state, he feels more intellectual, more in tune with nature, more the appropriate response to it. So he's like, then it looked like I was running from something that I dreaded. That's like something that you fear you're fleeing from. So it's just this wild, reckless, like running almost away from, you see what I mean? Then a man searching for something that he loves, that, is when you get quiet and you dig and you reflect and you, there's an element of passion in both, but it's different. Keep going down. Look in the, look in the parentheses around line 72, 73. What was he like as a boy? Thoughtless. What else? Can you find the parentheses? Are you with me? Because it just says it as plain as day. It pleasures her closer and more rough because it takes her skin, maybe? Yes. Rough, coarse, not an intellectual kind of thing. But look at the next line. What is he moving like? A glad animal. <laughs> it was an animalistic, just primal, sort of na natural instinct to nature. But how do you see him now? How would he describe himself now? You can use your own words or words from the poem itself. moving around he sits in solitude sublime thoughts um, this happened to me when I went away to Cambridge to study abroad for a semester when I actually entered college I was a cheerleader and social life was everything to me just talk 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 move move move, move. <laughs> that's all I did when I came back from England I liked to sit in coffee shops and under trees and write poetry and think deeply um, to this degree. When I entered college, I took the Myers-Briggs personality test and I was an off the charts extrovert. Like I didn't fit on there. I was off the charts extrovert. When I graduated from college, I was an off the charts introvert. <laughs> and so the counselor brought me in and she said, what happened to you? And I'm like, what do you mean? And she said, were you abused? Did you get divorced? Did somebody in your family die? What happened to you? And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. And she said, we've never seen anybody go from extreme extrovert to extreme introvert in four years. And I laughed and I said, oh, I just learned how to think. 
<laughs> That's all it was. My semester in Bride taught me how to think. But don't you see that here? He's like, once I was a boy running and animal-like and joyous pleasures, yes. But it's dizzy raptures. It's just like wound up crazy young boy. Now he's just subdued. He's intellectual. He's thinking, I'm trying to get somewhere in the middle now between extrovert and introvert because it was a big pendulum swing. <laughs> There's advantages to both. All right, <clears throat> with a partner, see if you can find examples of alliteration around line 100. Since we've done alliteration today, just do it with a partner. Find them really quickly. Everybody found some. All right, shout some out. Mind of man and motion. Thinking things and thought. Setting suns. Then it asks you for parallel structure. Do you know parallel structure? Parallelism. Yes, the syntax, the sentence structure is duplicated. The same word order, often even with the same word. Where can you find an example around that same area? In the round ocean and the wooden air, in the blue sky and in the mind of man. Yeah, in the adjective noun, in the adjective noun, that works. Yes, all thinking things, all thought, all things. That's great. Around line 110, he says, uh, well pleased to recognize in nature and the language of the sense, the anchor of my purest thoughts, the nurse, the guide, the guardian of my heart and soul of all my moral being. Who would we describe in that way? God or the Holy Spirit. We would say he is our anchor of our pure thoughts. That he is our nurse, our comforter, our guide, our heart guardian, the soul of my morale. Wouldn't we say that about God or the Holy Spirit or Jesus? What is he saying it about? nature so if he's talking about nature as if it is divine he is a worshiper of nature did you hear that line too when he said i so long a worshiper of nature yep i think he he, he fell just short of the point number 11 who is he talking to now? He was talking to a river, no longer. Who is he talking to now? His sister. Um, Wordsworth obviously is the speaker in this poem because we know from his travels and his sister was named Dorothy. You'll learn a lot more about her when we're in Grasmere. That is Wordsworth country. You will go to his house. But we wanted to go here because this is related to this particular poem. So the whole rest of the poem, line 112 down, he's talking to his sister. Here's the way I picture it. Maybe he was just sitting there quietly next to the river, overlooking Tintern Abbey, writing his poem, and his sister is just running around, running everywhere through nature. And then she maybe plops down next to him, says, what you doing? And so he turns to her and he wants to encourage her about what nature can do for her in the same way that he has sort of transcended what he used to be 
He wants that for her too. He says, um, in thy voice, I catch the language of my former heart and read my former pleasures in the shooting lights of thy wild eyes. You see, he sees himself, his younger self in her. Wild eyes, wild. What literary technique? We talked about it earlier. Assonance. Um, because the wild and the while have a slightly different sound, so it can't be alliteration, but the I, I, I does. That is assonance. He advises her that nature never does betray the heart that loved her. This one, I always kind of giggle at a little bit and struggle with a little bit. Nature would never hurt anyone who loved or respected her. <laughs> but I think about what tornadoes don't hit you unless you don't like nature. Like it doesn't make sense. I, uh, earthquakes, tsunamis, whatever natural disaster you can think of, you know, I don't see it as a respecter of persons. He would say, if you love it, it's not going to hurt you. I mean, maybe that stems from my own vast fear of the ocean. <laughs> I'm not just going to go way down like, love you, ocean. You're not going to get on me, are you? I mean, good luck with that, right? What literary techniques do you see in that same line? Personification of? Nature. You have alliteration with nature never. Um, okay, what is this literary technique? So inform, so impress, so feed. You just, is that parallelism? It is parallel structure or parallelism. Good. Around line 140, we're looking for which is the simile and which is the metaphor. When these wild ecstasies shall be matured into a sober pleasure, when thy mind shall be a mansion for all lovely forms, thy memory be as a dwelling place. Where's the simile? Memory as a place. Yes, because similes use what two words? Like or, like or as. So if if that's the simile, where's the metaphor? Thy mind shall be a mansion. So he's talking about what happens to his sister when she learns to embrace nature in the way that he has. And as you read on, he says, um, no matter what bad things happen to you, solitude, fear, pain, grief, whatever your lot is, these are the healing thoughts that you can go back to and they bring you delight and zeal and holier love. And even when you're far from it, these places will be more dear to you, both for their sake and for yours. That's how he ends it. So we're gonna back up to the phrase in line, set, I mean, in question seven, and this is where I want to end. He says, here I stand, not only with the sense of present pleasure, but with pleasing thoughts that in this moment, there is light and food for future years. Explain or respond. In this moment, there is life and food for future years. What's the use of food? Nourishment, Nourishment sustenance, pleasure. So how is a moment or a place food? Mental energy could be a stopping point. Say that again. Food is also a display. Food for thought. Your happy place. I have this line written on one or two of our England Study Abroad t shirts. 
I think it's as important, if not more so, than I'm a part of all that I've met that we did the other day. In this moment, there is life and food for future years. I know what it's like to not be profoundly affected by something, but to be like, yeah, that's kind of cool. I like it. You know, when I studied here, I was, I turned 20 while I was in England the first time. And I was sort of soaking everything in, but I wouldn't say there was a massive appreciation for it. Um, I was kind of homesick. I really missed my boyfriend. But the effect of it later on is why you're here. I, I, you could not have told me sitting in my little dorm room in the attic space overlooking Parker's Peace in Cambridge, you could not have told me then that I would fall so much in love with England that I would return as often as possible for the rest of my life, that I would take 365 students so far, that doesn't include adults, to all of these same places. You could not have told me that because I was just kind of in the moment, but kind of not. And so just tuck it away. Some of you may have the experience and the maturity to be on the other end of Wordsworth's experience. It's sublime, it's intellectual, it's, it's food for, for a long time. Others may feel like I'm still the bounding row and that's okay because you're young, you're allowed to. I don't expect you to all be like scholars this moment, but just tuck these things away in your heart and your brain and there's a chance one day they become your happy place, your sublime thoughts, your pastoral pleasures. Any questions? Okay. Matt, how long can they? Hey, I'm never